Can you see my screen? Yes, I and I'm recording now, okay? Sure. We can see your screen. Okay, good. Uh, all right, uh, so good morning, good day, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I welcome all of you to this session on SSI and biometrics, uh, building identities for tomorrow. And uh, I'm the Jani Mohanty. I work uh, for an organization called Earth ID, and uh, where we are building um, identities, decentralized identity and biometrics based uh, um, applications. Um, so, um, like already said that I'm a blockchain author as well, and my latest work is blockchain for self-sovereign digital identity. And uh, uh, so, in, in today's uh, uh, session, I'll be covering mostly, you know, the biometrics-based authentication, um, a different type of biometrics, uh, type, you know, with their pros and cons, and the issues in the biometric solutions. Um, I won't go to detail out SSI because I believe that most of you are aware how self-sovereign identity works, uh, but I'll just touch base upon it so that you'll know that how these two technologies can work together and come up with uh, you know, the Earth ID solution, few of our solution. And then we'll uh, discuss some use cases which are either in production or pretty close um, and uh, with some you know, innovation in this field. And finally, if time allows, then we'll do some question and answer session. So um, first of all, uh, I don't think that any of you uh, have any doubt that why biometrics is used for authentication. Uh, today, organizations identify a person from their name, address, phone number, or email ID, uh, which can change. Uh, so, um, with such information, one person can create many identities at a time. So you might have heard that a person um, has got five different passports, you know, fake passports. So why it is possible is because um, we use such kind of information and they are not unique. Also, there might be a complex process to update the data associated with your identity. For example, uh, pretty recently, I had to update my address on my Aadhaar, which is uh, India's uh, national identity system. And it really took us so much of process, such a lengthy process and pretty complex. Um, however, if biometrics is uh, something which represents your identity, then it is very unique to a person and biometrics is the real you. You are actually carrying your biometrics along with you. So it won't lead to uh, hassles like such. And perhaps that's the reason that why that uh, global um, biometrics market is expected to top US dollar 50 billion by 2024. So let's start with biometrics. Um, so uh, currently, most of the applications, you know, uh, in today's world, people are moving towards a passwordless world. Why? Because first of all, user ID and passwords are hassles. You have to remember them, and many people use the same user ID again and again. Maybe their email ID or contact number. Uh, however, the biometrics are forever. Um, most passwords are very easy to guess, but you cannot guess somebody's. Uh, biometrics, resetting uh, the password is a, a process that you have to do again and again, but with biometrics, you don't need it. Um, like I already said, user ID, mobile number, email IDs, et cetera, can change. Um, however, the biometrics doesn't change, especially, I mean, for a very long time period, maybe you can say um, from, from a kid, from a, a baby to adulthood, uh, biometrics might change a little bit, but Again, it um, stays with you for a very long time. Um, hackers can uh, steal the uh, user ID and the password through different uh, social engineering technologies, um, but uh, it's difficult. I mean, it's, I won't say that biometrics can't be stolen, but it's actually difficult and much more expensive. Um, so, and often uh, you are using, like I already said, that the same user IDs are used again and again. Uh, the same e email ID or same contact number you are using uh, for multiple applications with multiple um, uh, different organizations. So it's easy to trace back the user because the, you are using the same user ID um, ever. 
But uh, so this is called correlation, which is pretty much possible with user IDs, but with biometrics, um, it's not that easy and very difficult to counterfeit. Now, uh, coming to how biometrics works. Um, the biometrics um, actually sensors scans the user's biometric data, such as the fingerprint, face, palm, et cetera. So here I'm showing the fingerprint, but it can be something else, your face, your palm, um, your ear, the pattern of your ear. There's so many different things uh, that you can scan with the scanner and it performs some pre-processing to enhance the quality of the captured biometric data. And some features are extracted which, uh, uh, from which the mapping is created, a mapping file is created. And from this mapping, a template is created which is a binary format. So usually people just wonder what is a biometric template. It looks like this, just one and zeros, binary, binary, uh, sorry, binary format, which you can save to a template database. So this is known as the uh, enrollment phase of a, um, where the biometric trait is captured and stolen, uh, sorry, uh, and stored in template database. So basically, Biometrics, just like user ID and password, it has got two different phases. So with your user ID and password, first you register and then you log in. Similarly, the first phase with biometrics is enrollment, where you are uh, providing your um, biometrics to the system and it's getting saved in terms of in uh, uh, like in uh, in terms of templates. At a later point of time, when you want to log in, which is called recognition, your biometrics is again captured and again the template is extracted, and those two templates are compared and uh, you know uh, for every system there is a threshold value uh, if uh, the matching is more than that threshold value then we consider it as a match otherwise no match so uh, can i ask one, a question yeah um why should we store the image if only the uh, template comparison is done uh, I'm sorry, the, the image is not stored. It's only the biometrics, uh, the template is stored. Maybe, you know. Yeah, because in, in your, uh, in your, uh, in your slide, there is a, something called an image archive. Which, okay, oh. so actually, yeah, maybe it's a little misleading. Uh, I, I'll update this. So actually we're not saving the image, but only the template. Beautiful, thank you. Okay, uh, so one major issue over here is, you know, while we try to find out what kind of biometrics that we need for the, for your application, um, one major factor is biometric effectiveness, which is um, the false acceptance rate and the false rejection rate. Uh, so the false acceptance rate measures how likely it is for an unauthorized user to be incorrectly given access. That means. Um, I am not the rightful owner, uh, but still I'm getting access, which is really, really uh, crucial for application not to uh, go with it. The second one is a false rejection rate. That means I'm the right user, so but I'm not getting access. So this major is how likely it is for an un, uh, for an authorized user not to get an access or denied access. So um, for uh, uh, authentication system especially, these two rates should be extremely, extremely low. Um, and and uh, there are other issues also in biometrics, like first of all, just like your user ID and password, um, the biometrics can also be stolen because a database that stores the biometric data can still be hacked. Um, this is mostly done so far, uh, this is mostly done in a centralized way, so this can be stolen. Um, the second one is injuries. So injuries can cause a biometric authentication not to work. Like if you have a burn on your finger, uh, it can, you know, it could lead to a negation on a fingerprint scanner. Third is false rejection and false acceptance rate that I just discussed out. Um, then some systems are harder to adapt for elderly or those with uh, having disabilities or maybe babies. So discomfort is another area. And finally, it is relatively expensive than the user ID and password. So, so there are so many so many different issues that we need to consider uh, before choosing the right kind of biometrics for our use case. Now, uh, there are different type of biometrics. Uh, broadly, they can be categorized into physiological and behavioral. So physiological is something like your iris, footprint, your face, uh, ear, uh, DNA, uh, palm pen. 
and uh, behavioral are something like your voice, the gait, or the way you walk, uh, the way you sign. So, um, so basically, uh, we at our third year mostly working with uh, physiological, but there are certain behavioral uh, biometrics that are under research we would be working. And I'll, I'll come up with some use cases why we need behavioral and why uh, behavioral is going to be used in many future use cases. So um, why I'm um, actually discussing so many different kinds of biometrics type because there is no particular biometrics which is considered to be the best. There are different, there is no one size that fits all over here. There are different use cases and for different use cases there could be different kind of biometrics that we need. So currently I'm going to um, uh, discuss a couple of biometrics that we are using at Earth ID and I'll compare them uh, on the basis of these factors, uh, security, accuracy, privacy, ease of use, health and hygiene, cost, how, how cost effective they are and uh, what are the exclusions. That, that means that who are the people who have to be excluded uh, for this kind of biometrics. So let's explore them one by one. First of all is fingerprint. So uh, fingerprint, of, of course, it's a very secure uh, biometrics and uh, it's a proved solution with a history of past almost 100 years. Um, ease of use is very high. Your fingerprint are always with you. Uh, and it is also very cost effective uh, because you know uh, there are so many, you might have seen so many fingerprint scanners everywhere. And uh, this is a technology which is being used um, highly uh, for the governments and many private sectors are also using it. However, coming to the disadvantage, number one is we leave our fingerprints on almost everything we touch. So make it, making it possible for them to be collected without our consent. So you might, you, you can visit YouTube and you can find how easily one can create a, a you know, fingerprint mold and they can use it um, against a, a scanner. So uh, really you know, easy for hacking. Also, uh, if we consider the health and hygiene, especially in the COVID time, um, uh, this, this uh, biometric pattern requires a direct contact with the sensor to identify the user. So it creates a hygiene concern when a scanner is shared among a, a large number of people. Then exclusions. Uh, so while fingerprints remain relatively stable over a person's lifetime, there are uh, sections of this uh, population which can be excluded using the system. For example, old people uh, and certain diseases, uh, people with certain kind of diseases might not um, use it because their um, fingerprint might have been worn out or less accurate um, to be compared. Uh, in babies also, uh, the uh, fingerprint is less developed. Um, when I tell you that accuracy is low, you won't believe because the fingerprint has been in use for such a long time, but it is uh, accurate. But then if we compare it with others, like if we see that what are the FRR, uh, false rejection, false accept acceptance rate, then fingerprint is relatively less than a couple of others, which I'm going to discuss out. So the next one is um, facial recognition. So um, again, in you know, health and hygiene is very high over here because you are not going to touch anything. You can do it from a distance and also ease of use is very high um, because you, know, uh, you can do it even from uh, your mobile phone. So it, this doesn't need a special camera. So ease of use is uh, very high and there are so many apps today uh, that you can run on your mobile device and uh, they can figure out who are you uh, from this technology, facial recognition. It is, like I said, it is cost effective because um, you can do it with a uh, ordinary camera in a smartphone. Um, there is no such exclusion. You can do it on babies, you can do it for, on elderly. Um, so on a diseased person, so facial recognition works for everyone. Um, uh, and also, this is a very fast technology. Um, the process of recognizing a face takes a second or less. Um, the, you know, so that is why you know uh, it is used widely across airports in the world for matching a picture in passport. When I come to uh, the negatives, first of all, privacy. 
So with the help of this technology, the government can track down uh, the criminals, but at the same time, it can actually track down people like you and me anytime and anywhere. So that is why you know, many countries, especially in Europe, citizens have raised their concern not to use this technology. Second one is accuracy. How accurate is facial recognition? Um, actually, this is not that accurate. So two people can look very similar. Um, what about identical twins? They look very similar, right? So, um, so that is why it is not that accurate. And also the facial features change almost a couple of years. So that is why you have to keep on updating your biometrics from time to time. Also the uh, false acceptance and false rejection rate can be pretty high with this. So of course, you know, considering the privacy and accuracy are low, so security is also low. Um, third one is retina. So many people uh, actually are not able to distinguish what is retina and what is iris. I will come to the iris in the next slide. So iris is the part of the eye that you can see uh, from front. Whereas retina is the back side of the eye where the image is getting formed. So, uh, so because this is a private part, so that is why it is extremely secure. Nobody can take a picture of your, um, of your um, you know, retina. Uh, this needs a special camera um, and it cannot be done with a regular camera. It cannot be done with your uh, mobile device on your smartphone. Um, the accuracy is very high. So extremely low false rejection rates, uh, close to 0% and low occurrence of false positives. Uh, so, and also, like I said, it's highly secure, highly accurate and highly private. So that is why um, it is being used in places, um, not, not on like mobile device, as I said, that it needs special camera, but it, it is used in places like um, FBI, or uh, NASA uh, to get access to certain areas. Now, uh, the negatives are, first of all, is of use because you know um, it, you, it uses a special kind of a camera and a person has to focus to a point for almost 15 seconds without moving their eyes. So, and some people um, you know, have a feeling of a temporary blindness after the retina scan. scan. So health and hygiene considering, you know, this is a contactless technology, but again, not for everyone. Um, and exclusions um, cannot be used for people with uh, no, the, uh, cataract or few other eye diseases. And like I said, health is also a problem. And, and also this is, this is highly expensive because you need a special camera. You cannot do it with regular camera. So it, it is expensive and not a technology for all use cases. Um, now coming to the iris, um, iris again is highly accurate. Um, not as accurate as the retina, but again, it is uh, accurate. Um, it is a private part, uh, even though people are able to see your uh, iris from front, but you can, they cannot see it you know, uh, to that extent. <laughs> and uh, health and hygiene is also high because you are not going to touch anything, you're not coming close contact with anything, uh, and it is secure. Uh, cost effective, like I said, you can take a picture of your iris from your regular smartphone. Uh, it can be used on uh, smartphones. And there is uh, not much exclusion, like you can do it even on babies. Babies also form their, the iris is al already formed in babies, so you can use it. And I'll come up with a use case where it is already used and um, uh, especially in SSI and, and biometrics together. Um, aids of use could be a concern, but it's not that high as a retina. Um, so some people like, like the babies might not like it when you would take a picture of them with their uh, iris, but again, it's not that big a hassle. So this is a, a very good area for biometrics. The next one is palm pain. So uh, palm pain is one of the latest area on biometrics. So uh, the palm pain is an internal biometrics, which means that your biometric um, code is never exposed to the outside world. So, you know, you can take the picture of the internals. Uh, so this is secure and accuracy is very high over here. This is, this is a private part. Um, there is no issue in health and hygiene. There is no exclusion. You can do it on babies or elderlies. Um, everyone has got a unique um, palm vein structure. Age of use is also very high. You are not going to touch anything. You just have to show your uh, palm vein and uh, and the camera would take the picture, but it actually needs a uh, you know 
a new technology for uh, taking the picture. So, uh, so th that new camera or new uh, scanner uh, would be needing some kind of investment and some learning curve is there. But then this, this area is uh, picking up uh, very high. Um, so, so you can see the comparison of uh, uh, all these uh, different uh, biometrics types. And you can see uh, in terms of the age of use and accuracy, palm pen seems to be the best at the moment. And But considering the fact that palm pen cannot be used with smartphone, the next possibility is iris. And also you can see that people uh, feel comfortable because when you think about a use case, you might not go with the, with the best technology, but the technology which everyone can use. So um, hand geometry is, or uh, palm pen is one very good idea, but then I would say that Iris um, is the one that we can use immediately without, without further investment or without learn, need to learn more. Now coming to the spoofing. So what is spoofing? So biometric spoofing is a method of fooling a biometric identification management system where an artificial object like uh, like in this case of fingerprint mold can be used uh, a, a silicon fingerprint mold can be used and presented to the biometric scanner which leads to the hacker to get access to authorized data um, and uh, services originally meant for the rightful owner so uh, spoofing can be done at various different stages. So like you can see in the right hand side, you can see this diagram where there is a sensor. So, and then there is an internal system where you are doing the extraction and all those things. So mostly the hacking takes place at the sensor level. And that is called, you know, the number one, which is the presentation attack. So people come up with a, a 3D mask or a photo or a video um, or a makeup surgery, or, you know, if they are doing it for a, fingerprint and with molds. So the sensor is the area where maximum attacks happen. But then there could be an attack internally also, but if it happens internally, then uh, maybe they would get access to the data, the templates, of course, not the or uh, original data, but templates of um, uh, a huge number of users. Uh, so that is an area that can be um, handled with uh, the right use of SSI. But when we talk about uh, the capturing the biometrics, that would be always there. So we have to deal with the presentation attack and how we do it is through anti-spoofing techniques. So um, when a, uh, the presentation happens or maybe when the capture, uh, the biometrics is captured at that time, you'd be, um, you know, given a challenge. They might ask you to blink your eyes or open your mouth or shake your head or, uh, or smile, uh, different kind of facial expressions of sadness or happiness or head movements. So all these things you have to do. Then there are sensors and uh, dedicated hardwares uh, which can check, you know, we can do uh, additional checks. So see, the thing is the smile or facial expression you can do even on a regular, you know, smartphone you know, camera. But the sensors, when we talk, talk, talk about sensor or dedicated hardware, those you cannot do on your uh, mobile device. So th those are for a different use case, perhaps. So um, there are sensors who would ask, uh, like, uh, sorry, where you know, if you are um, if you are giving your friend fingerprint, then they might uh, check what is the uh, temperature of your fingers. So from that, they can figure out whether it's a real finger or it's a or a mold. Uh, similarly, there are algorithms which can check the, um, you know, high resolution pictures and uh, figure out that whether it's a real uh, face or a fake one. So uh, these are the different um, anti-spoofing technologies. Um, all right. So now, uh, liveness detection test. So th these are actually th these are called actually liveness detection test which mostly uh, people do uh, in authentication purpose on your smartphones. Um, however, liveness detection test is not needed in palm pen because in palm pen, uh, the camera is actually taking a picture which is not static. It's a dynamic picture and it is able to figure out whether the blood is even moving inside the blood vessels. So, um, so there is no need of uh, doing a separate liveness detection test in palm pen. Uh, now, uh, coming to SSI, I'll, I'll quickly browse through SSI. I, I believe that most of you might uh, have good amount of um, idea on self-sovereign identity. 
So uh, self-sovereign identity is a, is a new type of uh, digital identity where uh, the issuer keeps on gathering um, verified credentials from different issuers. Um, so the user, uh, sorry, the, the issuer is actually sending the verified credential to the user's uh, digital wallet and the user can share it with verifier. So here, let's say the issuer is somebody like uh, the passport office and the verifier is somebody like the visa office. Um, so while the issuer is uh, sharing the data with the user, the issu issuer is also sending a reference hash to the blockchain and the verifier actually is able to know uh, whether the data is valid or not, whether the, uh, who is the issuer and uh, the data is valid or not from uh, no, that hash. The issuer is converting the data to hash and checking it them, uh, themselves that, um, to know that whether the data is valid. So there is, at, at a later point of time, if the issuer wants, then they can revoke it by changing the hash on the blockchain and the verifier would be able to know that it has been updated. So there are so many different uh, you know, properties that um, we achieve through this kind of architecture, the integrity, ownership, privacy, security, and validity of the data. Um, so, but in a real world, um, you know, what happens is like in a real world, we have multiple issuers. Like, let's say the first issuer is the hospital where, let's say Alice is born in a hospital. So the hospital is issuing the first set of certificate. Now, the second certificate is uh, provided by the government, um, uh, maybe something like a national ID. The third one is an educational uh, VC and the fourth one is a uh, employment verified credential. And those data are collected on the user's uh, or the holder's mobile device. And the user can share it to, uh, with the different verifiers and the data can be shared in different, uh, uh, different means like it can be a traditional sharing or zero knowledge proof and selective disclosure type of sharing or, or it, it could be a self-attested sharing. And also there is a public ledger on which the deeds are decentralized, IDs are created, uh, reference are sent and revocation happens. So um, what, is, what is actually uh, something that uh, we keep on forgetting that the first issuer is the one who has the maxi maximum responsibility over here because the other issuers are actually um, the verifiers also. Like, let's say the, the first issuer is mostly the government. Let's say the government is providing you the national identity, which is unique, and you are showcasing it to different verifiers and they become the second issuer or the third issuer like that. So it works like a chain, uh, but the responsibility of the first issuer is maximum because they also have to do a deduplication of the data uh, to figure out that uh, whether it's, I mean, the user is not creating multiple fake identities for themselves. So deduplication is also an area that we have to um, you know, take care in our ideal uh, world. Um, so now we also have to, you know, the SSI is pretty complex. We have to take care of the web standards, um, authentication standards, and uh, the open source blockchain part, and also the identity part. So th there are different, um, different um, uh, part of the you know, entire ecosystem. So how it works is, uh, you know, you, as a user, you, Alice is keeping all, all her data in her mobile device. Whereas um, Bob is uh, keeping the data uh, in the mobile device uh, as a local storage, as well as a copy on the cloud storage. But please, um, please note that the biometrics template is something that is not to be shared on any other device. So the key in this kind of architecture is, you have to keep your biometrics data um, as much possible in your mobile device. Do not send it over, uh, do not share it to any cloud storage, do not share it, uh, send it to any third party as much as possible. So the organization can always keep their encrypted data in a uh, data vault in a cloud storage. And also there is a public DLT, um, so which is just uh, um, you know, just making sure that all the deeds are created properly and the, and the uh, transaction hashes are there. Now let's come to our third is next gen authentication with decentralized biometrics. So, um, so here, uh, what we are doing, we are actually working with different kind of biometrics. Like 
we are working with fingerprints, which many people are doing. We are working with uh, uh, iris um, and uh, face uh, as of now. Um, we are also thinking, of, we are just uh, coordinating with uh, other organizations where um, to make sure that how hand geometry can also be captured, whether it is possible or maybe for as a future use case, we are researching on that. And also we are researching on uh, different behavioral um, biometrics because um, the, um, the voice is something even that a mobile can capture it might not be a gate, Gate is the way you work, but voice is something that the mobile device can uh, can uh, actually evaluate. So that is for a uh, that that is for future. But we are actually doing um, uh, analysis on all this part. So how the entire thing works is um, user first captures the biometric after likeness check and converts it to a template. So that happens in your mobile device, and the template then goes to the issuer. The issue, you know, you can see number. Two, I have numbered them um, for you to understand. So the issue is doing a background verification. In number three, you can see the background verification. Then the uh, the issue is also doing deduplication. So this is not needed for all issues, but maybe the first issue. Uh, or maybe depending upon your use case, whether you know what kind of use case you have, do you need a du du deduplication or do you not? And that there is a template storage if everything goes right. Please note that here we are still using a centralized biometric template database, but that is only one time. The first time when the user is getting authenticated against the first issuer. Um, and next time, number five, come to number five, when the user is trying to log in, at that time, um, you know, it is the biometrics, uh, uh, the live biometrics is again um, uh, collected and compared against the one which is stored in the, um, uh, on the mobile device. And then, you know, you can do it even, you know, one, one level of encrypting can also be done. And also then um, the, it is sent to the verifier. The hash is sent to the verifier and the verifier can check on the blockchain that whether the hash is something which is uh, uh, certified by the issuer. And uh, if all goes well, then user is considered to be um, authenticated. So this is something a very similar use case is done by QLedger uh, and you can find it um, in the news that they have gone to production with this use case. Um, and where, so QLedger is basically a credit union in US and uh, they ha are associated with multiple uh, other banks and cooperative societies most probably. And you know, once the uh, user logs in to the uh, credit union or QLedger, then the others, it's just like, it behaves like a SSO. So the other verifiers trust uh, the credit union and they give access to the user. So it happens on Hyperledger ND and uh, I do not know whether they have started using biometrics. Maybe they are using fingerprint, uh, but I do not find that news in the um, anywhere. I don't see that whether they are using actively, uh, uh, you know, biometrics. Even then, even if they are using whether it's a fingerprint, I think it is fingerprint. I'm not very sure. But we are doing the same use case with uh, multiple different biometrics uh, templates. Depending upon the uh, what the user need, we can do different uh, biometrics uh, types. Um, there are certain other use cases that I would like to discuss. Um, first of all, I respond. So this is a again um, a use case which you, uh, you you can find that uh, this is this is a use case. I think this is. A, either implemented in Africa or South America uh, by an NGO called iRespond. And they're using um, Hyperledger ND. And uh, this solution is, I believe, is on Sovereign. And uh, so uh, basically, this, this is a special use case here. Uh, they, uh, this use case is implemented in a country where the mobile penetration is low. Like, no, so you cannot use a mobile. Maybe people do not have mobile or even if they have mobile, they are not smartphones. So obviously you cannot, uh, uh, you, you know, the architecture cannot be something like what I discussed over here. So it has to be different. So how we can handle um, a use case where the user doesn't have a mobile device. So in this case, what happens that in these countries, uh, third world countries where uh, 
a lot of uh, kidnapping happens of the children. So people kidnap the children and take them across the border and, um, you know, and then they're exploited. So uh, what those governments are trying to do is they want to issue a digital certificate or decentralized digital certificate to each child. Um, and uh, so the child can be a newly born baby or the child can be in anybody who is less than a particular age, maybe 18 or 16 whatsoever. And uh, there is power of attorney or digital power of attorney, which is assigned to the child's uh, legal guardian or uh, uh, custodian. So how that happens is the child's decentralized ID is created by an NGO and that decentralized ID is associated with the child's um, iris. So it's not the fingerprint, but they are using iris. Why? It, it's because uh, fingerprint is not something uh, that you can, uh, you know, get correctly from a baby. The, for them, it's not well developed. But iris is well developed. So they take the picture of the iris, convert it to a template, and then uh, you know, and associate that with the decentralized uh, identity of the child, and the. Uh, the parents' uh, biometrics as well as the deed are also created and they are linked with each other, be it a parent or a custodian, whoever it is. Now, when the child is um, taken across the border, I mean, to, to cross the border, then the border uh, uh, security officers have to check that whether the child is the right child and whether the guardian has given their consent. So how that would happen? Because these people do not have a mobile device. So a printed copy of their deed, a printed, in fact, not a copy, it's a QR code of, the, um, of all the details are um, you know, handed over to their parents by the NGO when the deed is created. Now, when the child is trying to cross the border, at that time, the border uh, security officer would check that whether it's the same child and they would also ask for a digital consent by the parents, by the rightful parents, and they would do it. And once all the things are validated, then only the child would be able to cross the border. So this uh, use case by I respond is actually, um, I think it's an UL. I'm not sure whether it has gone to production, but it was in news uh, lately. Um, so yeah, the second one is uh, airports of tomorrow. So this is not a use case that people have implemented so far, but I'm just, uh, um, you know, I, I just got curious if this can happen and uh, we are also exploring this use case. So um, this kind of technology, you know, to scan somebody's face and uh, to scan somebody's iris in the in the airport, uh, is something which is already happening, but in a centralized way. So there are um, uh, automatic uh, check gates uh, in certain airports in uh, in US and UK, where you know from a distance, um, you know they would be able to scan the the person's uh, from the person's gate or the per person's uh, face, and then. No, there is still some level of uh, some level of uh, uh, checking, but then the user would be given access to go uh, without doing so much of struggle. Like you know, at today's date, you know we have to do. If you go to something like you know JFK Airport or um, London Heathrow, you have to wait um, at the queues. You have to wait in queues uh, for the security check-in uh, and boarding. But here. Uh, a day would come in future where, uh, if especially if we are using SSI, because even now we are using it in a centralized way. But if we are, if we use SSI along with biometrics, maybe the person's uh, biometrics would be captured from a distance, and uh, and the person would be allowed. So how that would happen is like when the user is booking the ticket from that point of time, the user's identity is checked. So um, this is a use case where the user's identity is checked at many different times. So when the user is booking the ticket, the first time the identity is checked. Then the user is um, uh, is entering the airport, the second time the uh, biometric, uh, sorry, the identity is checked. Uh, third, the user is going to security check-in, that at that time also the identity check and finally when the user is onboarding. So there are so many different uh, uh, checkpoints where the biometrics are checked, but then currently it is being done in a centralized way, but in future, maybe we would combine the SSI 
along with biometrics and what kind of biometrics we can use um, because you know uh, today we are using face because it's relatively easy and uh, um, many people are using it already um, but tomorrow maybe we, we would be either using iris or we would be using the gate or the way the user is walking. So from a distance, they would be able to know that this person has already uh, booked a ticket. This person uh, has um, already um, you know, done the security check-in. So let um, the person board the flight. So, so, so uh, there are cert certain information that the user would share from his or her mobile device in the pocket and from a proximity, all the doors would be open to them. So there would be no more queues, there would be no more queues and there would be complete automation of check-in and boarding. So this is a future use case. So we are researching on uh, this one as well. Um, if possible, we'd be doing it with the gate or the way the user walks in. Um, so, so what are the SSI success factors that, you know, we have figured out the first of all, so how seamlessly we are integrating the biometrics and what are the different kind of biometrics that we are integrating? Because like I said, different use cases might be needing different kind of biometrics. Um, then is your uh, solution scalable? You have to always look into it as if it is a scalable solution and how soon you are doing the entire thing, like auth authentication, the people would not wait for if you keep them uh, getting, you know, waiting for a very long time. Also, if your false rejection and false acceptance is high, you know, that would not work for authentication. So depending upon that, uh, you have to figure out you know, whether these uh, solutions are scalable and throughput. Cybersecurity, of course, you have to uh, figure out whether um, you know, cybersecurity is uh, good enough. You, know, you have to do a lot of uh, negative testing to check that your solution is working perfectly. Uh, interoperable in a future date, maybe different kind of um, uh, different kind of uh, uh, decentralized identity networks can be completely interoperable. And even if it doesn't matter whether you have created your data in one application, you can still do, go with the other application and uh, do something else and still it would work. Um, how nice is your, is your selective disclosure and zero knowledge proof work? So that is also a success factor of your application. And also, who are your validated nodes? So that also plays a major role. Like some people keep on telling me that, who are the validated nodes? So are they some, uh, some companies who are well known? So you have to see that, you know, what kind of, uh, valid, who are the, your validated nodes? And uh, this is one area that uh, uh, would lead to, um, you know, fetching more clients for your application, for your, uh, for your services. Um, so I think, uh, I'm done with my presentation. So if you have any questions, uh, you can ask me right now, or maybe you can ask me uh, on LinkedIn, I'm available. Yeah, um, looks like uh, Nikki Hickman has mm -hmm. raised a question in the chat. I can read it out. Uh, mm -hmm. One is the one that talks about the deduplication. De Mm -hmm. It says, uh, can you explain a little more about deduplication? Is this deduplication of biometric templates themselves? In which case, why? We already know that many biometrics need to be refreshed or is it a deduplication versus individual unique identity? Is this case, how, in this case, how does this sit with the fundamentals of SSI that you can have many different quote unquote identities or is it just data cleansing? Okay, yeah. So uh, first of all, like I said, that deduplication is not every uh, for every use case, right? It is for certain use case. Like I was showing you this uh, slide where you know there are so many different issuers, okay? It's only the responsibility of the first issuer. So mostly the first issuers are the government. Like if you go to the Singapore, uh, they are creating a national identity based on SSI. So the, the first issuer's job is deduplication so that the user does not uh, create a lot of fake identities, what people are doing as of now, because we, we, are, we don't have that kind of system to check it up. Uh, we are using, um, we are not using biometrics in many places. So deduplication is the major role of the first issuer. Now, the first issuer, so uh, let's say the first issuer is the government. So the first issuer has to do background verification that whether the person is the uh, you know, right person, like, you know, let's say in Aadhaar in India. 
So uh, if you have to create your Aadhaar ID, then people even come to your home to check that whether your address is the right address. Um, so the background verification has to be done and deduplication also have to be done. So this deduplication is not only on your uh, on your address, but also uh, on your biometrics data. So why it is so is because let's say I got five people in my home. Okay. And all, all our addresses are the same, like me, my husband, my kids, and my, uh, my parents or so. So all of our addresses are the same, but then our biometrics are different. So that is why a biometrics matching has to be done to make sure that it is a unique identity. Now, uh, what she said is also right that at a future point of time, let's say your biometrics are changed. So let's say that your biometrics is based on your face. Now your face has changed drastically. Like even today, my children get a passport which is valid only for five years because they are uh, uh, up to a certain age. So you know, depending upon that, maybe you need to change the biometrics. So that also is a separate use case. But for all these things, you have to do deduplication, right? Uh, otherwise, how do you know that who the person is? You know, if, if it is the same person, then we have to update it. If it is a new person, then also we have to check that the same, uh, you know, there is no duplicate uh, in the same biometrics. So, of course, th there is a deduplication process which has to happen at the issuer, at, especially at the first issuer, which, who is like a government. Um, so, in the right hand side, I'm showing that this, this uh, feature can work for the uh, authentication of the same issuer or maybe for a different issue, just like what the queue ledger is doing. Uh, so you can log into the same system or to a different system, just like in Aadhaar, uh, you can log into Aadhaar using your same data or there are certain banks who, uh, when you create accounts with them, they actually log into the Aadhaar database to check that whether your biometrics are matching with the, what the person whom you claim to be. So obviously there would be a need of deduplication uh, when, especially when the security is uh, very high. Okay, so her next question obviously in that uh, stream is that uh, the fundamentals of SSI says that you can have many different quote unquote identities, which obviously are the pairwise dids or something like that, but underneath all that is the same person. So uh, there has, you know, there's a contradiction there. Uh, she's, uh, or he, I, I don't know whether Nikki is a- um, Hi, sorry, it's <laughs> let you work so hard on that. Yeah, the, um, I'm interested in this deduplication um, as you explained it. Um, it, it seems to always relate back to this initial issuer, this which you suggest is normally a national government, um, a, a government ID. Um, and I, I just wonder around continually referencing back to that, whether that might not build centralization um, and control points, um, which is obviously important for some use cases um, within a particular eco ecosystem, but doesn't necessarily give the full range of benefits, I'd say, to the holder um, the SSI promises. Um, does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, yeah, actually, hi, Nikki. Uh... Yeah, you are absolutely right. There are certain use cases which needs a person to have multiple identities. Like let's say that you have five different devices and those devices are all linked to you. Um, and again, uh, those devices need to interact with each, each other. What, what is, uh, what's gonna happen in IoT? Uh, but that's a different use case. So that has to be handled differently, but I'm more uh, you know, inclined towards how a national identity would work. So in national identity, your biometrics have to be kept somewhere. So uh, as of now, we do not have a technology where we can completely decentralize it, but maybe in future we can do it. But as of now, because uh, even if you need to compare your biometrics with, with some reference, 
what would be that difference? And if we say that we have to, um, we don't want to keep all this centralized, uh, you know, biometrics template. We we are actually working in this area. We are researching a little bit in this area if this can be decentralized. But as of now, um, it is it would lead to um, security issues because we have to compare the template, the biometrics template, with an existing one. Um, so yeah, so this is an area of research, I would say. And what Sorry. about, uh, go ahead, Nikki. Do you have anything more? Yeah, I mean, I personally, I just see a biometric as another attribute. And in that way, you could see a template as just another form of credential. And um, so it, it kind of concerns me that you're you're still storing this data. It should be... I mean, maybe it's a, a dream, but it should be sufficient that the biometric is just used to bind a living human being to a particular credential or set of credentials. And therefore the proof that the verifier has just needs to be the link between the person in front of them or the person they're transacting with and um, that the proof that they've got from the chain in, in terms of the uh, the, the verifiability of it. Um, I can see that within a national system, they want to always go back to one unique individual, but I think that's missing lots of opportunities. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. Building in um, further risk, like you could embed, um, you know, if you, in this model, if you can hack the initial issuer, then and kind of force an update and you know that it's yeah. got security. so uh, coming back to your question nikki um, actually the way biometrics comparison is done is very different from the way you uh, compare the alphanumerics so in alphanumerics it's always the if the com uh, comparison uh, in, in the comparison if it matches then it's a 100% match in biometrics, it does not always match 100%. Sometimes you can have false rejection rates also, even if you are the rightful owner. So why that happens is because uh, it is actually giving rise to a biometric template, which is uh, 101010 like that. So let's say that you are pressing your thumb a little differently. Let's say that, uh, you know, your uh, thumb is a little, you know, it has got an injury. I mean, that could be very small differences and depending upon that it can lead to uh, rejections or maybe that there could be a close match so the way biometrics is compared is very different from the way alphanumerics are compared so that is why what we are doing we are still keeping our centralized repository like i said in future maybe we won't need it but uh, i mean uh, we can come up with a technology where we won't need it but as of now we have to keep a centralized uh, repository, um, uh, especially for the biometrics. I'm not saying uh, for others, but for biometrics, it's uh, the first issue, which is like a government is keeping a centralized repository. And the part that uh, we are sending uh, as a hash, this is the first time hash. And further, you, know, you, you can see when the user is logging in again and again and again, again, we are not going back to the issue. We are not going back. We are just checking that whether the hash is matching with the version which is there in the uh, on the uh, on the same mobile device. So it's the, just a one timer. First time we are doing it, uh, but like you said, I'm also uh, looking out for us uh, for a solution where we won't be needing this centralized biometric template anymore uh, a database here. But uh, this uh, how soon we can do that? Only time would tell. Because uh, I, live in, I live in a country where we have Aadhaar, which is the biggest biometrics database in the world. So, so that is why the concern is more over here. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's interesting research. Um, look forward to the results of that. Yeah. Uh, so if it were not stored in a centralized uh, database, uh, maybe it would be, but, but the, let, let's see why it is stored in a centralized database because you are uh, going through this process of deduplication and all that. And if you lose your device, you lose everything, then you can recover it. That's one of the things. Otherwise you have to go through the same process again. 
right? The second thing is if, if the uh, match, which I believe is a fuzzy match, we actually have a um, paper in uh, Identity Working Group that was uh, donated by Danny Bathen of IBM, which is one of our first papers, which talks about how this whole process works. And we have it linked in our page. It's about the, uh, the way the, the template is calculated and also about the matching algorithm itself, because obviously you cannot have an exact match. Um, and it's a fuzzy, fuzzy match. And, uh, you know, uh, the point is maybe there is a way to uh, create that uh, storage in a IPFS or something like that, that is much more decentralized, but, you know. I, I have seen some models where um, instead of the issuer having the centralized biometrics or looking after that aspect of authentication, um, they have a biometric service provider that would work alongside your agent or wallet provider. Um, so that, that's decentralization at one level. It's certainly not relying on a single issuer to be the, the kind of owner. But then you're centralizing the storage somewhere else. Uh, uh, I mean, even though it is a service provider, they, they can be hacked as well. So, uh, but, yeah, but that, that's kind of the choice of the individual as opposed to the choice of the issuer. And you could have multiple biometric service providers just as you could have multiple agents and wallets. Yeah, uh, I mean, in the end, you if you accept that it has to be stored away from the device or from the edges, then you have this problem. Anyway, uh, it has been a delightful hour. We are at 10.01. And uh, many thanks to Debiani uh, for this wonderful presentation and to you, Nikki, for the questions. And uh, one of the things I want to emphasize here is that uh, the Identity Working Group is looking for presentations and we want to be inclusive and diverse. And, I, and uh, I've deliberately chosen the first uh, presentation this year to be a woman, because that is very important. We have very few uh, people presenting that are, you know, in a truly diverse uh, people. And, and I think that that is extremely important. And I, and I also run uh, this uh, other group called the Hyperledger Capital Markets SIG. And I have chosen that. So 2021 for me uh, should be where we showcase uh, the diversity of our membership in our community. Uh, so please get back to me if you're interested in presenting or doing, uh, have any ideas about how to go forward here. Uh, and many thanks to Deviani again. Um, I, I hope she will share her slides with us. Uh, sure, sure, I'll do that now. And then I will uh, make the slides and the recording available on the, uh, on the site that I, posted on the, on the chat. And I can probably uh, reflect it back in, uh, in LinkedIn or some, some other space as well so that people can find it. Thank you again. And our next uh, presentation is going to be two weeks from now. Thank, Thank you. you. It was a pleasure. Thanks.